Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our panel, Shareholder Proposals, Strategies, and Tactics. My name is Cam Huang, and I'm a partner here in the corporate group. I have a diversified practice. I do corporate governance, SEC compliance, some M&A. And uh, I've worked with clients both in-house and here at Dorsey on, on shareholder proposals. Joining me on the panel today is uh, Gary Tigeson. Now, uh, Gary gave me my first uh, shareholder proposal project when I was an associate just starting off at Dorsey. Gary has over 35 years of experience advising public companies and their boards of directors with respect to corporate governance, SEC compliance, public company disclosure, finance, shareholder activism, and executive compensation. And also joining me on this panel and offering her fresh perspective is Violet Richardson. <clears throat> Violet is an associate and her practice focuses on a variety of domestic and international corporate matters, including business formation, corporate governance, mergers and acquisitions, and regulatory compliance. And uh, she's been helping me and Gary very much in the same way that I used to help Gary as an associate. And Cam, if my memory serves me correctly, that very first shareholder proposal that you and I worked on together way back when, we were successful in getting that excluded from the proxy statement. Uh, that's right. I, I believe that's true. And actually, uh, I am undefeated when it comes to no action letters, but uh, in part that because I just choose very carefully. So a good I, tactic. <laughs> yes. So we have a fairly full agenda today. Uh, we're going to tackle some shareholder proposal basics first. Then we're going to move on and talk about steps to take after receiving a shareholder proposal, bases and process for excluding a proposal, and alternatively, the process for including a shareholder proposal in, in your annual meeting materials. Then we'll move on to 2016 proxy season highlights and end with some trends and developments that everyone should expect to see in 2017. We really are in the midst of the proxy proposal season, so we hope you find this to be a timely review. So uh, just starting off with uh, a few facts that uh, most people uh, know or will remember. Uh, so shareholder proposals, uh, they are brought because shareholders are seeking to have matters acted on by the board or management at an annual or special meeting. And what laws and rules control these proposals? Uh, well, there are two main categories. So those proposals that come outside of a proxy statement <clears throat> must be submitted in accordance with state corporation laws and a company's organizational documents, and then specifically there we're referring to advance notice bylaws. Proposals that are submitted to be included in a company's proxy statement must comply with Rule 14A8 of the Exchange Act, and that's really going to be the focus of our discussion for today. You know, I'm often asked uh, by clients, when can shareholder proposals bind a company? And uh, the answer is that they are typically non-binding because under state corporation law, shareholders usually don't have the power to require the board to take action on a basis that would interfere with the board's ability to govern the affairs of the corporation. However, there are situations where shareholders may invoke their power under state law to adopt bylaws in order to make binding proposals. And a recent example of this would be binding proposals on majority voting for directors. Now, Violet, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, eligibility for submitting shareholder proposals. Thanks, Cam. Two questions you should know the answer to at the outset of this process. Who is eligible and when should the proposal be submitted? Shareholder proposals may be filed only by an investor who has held $2,000 worth of the company stock or 1% of the shares eligible to vote, whichever figure is smaller, continuously for at least one year before the date the proposal is submitted to the company. It is important to note that the proponent must pledge to continue to hold the securities through the date of the annual meeting, not just a record date for the meeting. So when must the proposal be submitted? Typically, shareholders must submit the proposal by the deadline disclosed in last year's proxy statement. But if that date is not disclosed, at least 120 days before the date of the company's proxy statement for the previous year's annual meeting. So you ask yourself, must the company accept a revised proposal? And the answer is only if the revised proposal is submitted before the deadline for the shareholder proposals with a small caveat. 
Thanks, Violet. Uh, so obviously, if a revision is needed as part of a no action request process, then uh, that can be accepted after the shareholder proposal deadline. So the steps to take after receiving a shareholder proposal. First, you will want to establish key deadlines for responding to the proposal. We have provided with the materials for this program a shareholder proposal deadline handout to guide you from receipt of the proposal to the mailing of the proxy. Second, you will want to confirm whether the proponent has met the ownership and timeliness requirements discussed on the previous slide. Other considerations uh, for uh, pr shareholder proposals are the rule that one proposal per, share, per shareholder must be submitted uh, for a particular meeting and the 500 word rule. It is important to note that the company must notify the proponent of any deficiencies and a time frame for response within 14 days of the receipt of the proposal. If the proponent fails to respond within 14 days of receiving the company's notice, the company may then submit a no action letter requesting the, the right to exclude the proposal. No action letters will be discussed a little later in this presentation. Notice does not need to be given for deficiencies that cannot be remedied. For example, failure to meet the proposal deadline. Just a couple of points, Violet, that are of interest on this 500 word count limitation. Um, first of all, a reference to a website address counts only as one word, but if you do receive a proposal that has a website address in it, go to the company's website and check it out because it's possible that you might be able to exclude that website reference if the website contains materially false or misleading subject matter or is irrelevant or otherwise in contravention of the proxy rules. The other point to notice is that graphics uh, do not count against the 500 word limit. The SEC has taken the very clear position that words are words and pictures are not. So um, GE actually submitted a no action letter request this year seeking to exclude graphics from a shareholder proposal and they lost that battle. The SEC has however stated that they're gonna look at graphics on a case by case basis. So that if you do receive a proposal this year that does have graphics in it, all is not lost. You can still seek to exclude them on grounds if they are false and misleading, irrelevant or impugn character, or you might also wanna to seek to exclude them if they are numerous, confusing, or otherwise increase the, significantly increase the cost of your proxy production. Thanks, Gary. And so fairly on, early on in the shareholder proposal process, uh, we feel it's important for clients to identify the ultimate goals for the shareholder engagement. And it goes without saying that uh, the goals depend very much on uh, the management team's philosophy on shareholder proposals, uh, the particular shareholder at issue, as well as, as the topic at hand. Um, I would say generally in our experience, uh, there are certain companies and certain industries that are more sensitive from a reputational standpoint, from a standpoint of wanting to engage with shareholders as well as a larger population of stakeholders where uh, they feel that it makes sense <clears throat> to actively engage um, either to advance the company's position on a certain issue, uh, such as an environmental, social, or governance issue, where uh, they would have a goal to strengthen the relationship with a proponent and to strengthen their reputation with shareholders and or to collaborate with shareholders on a further study of the proposal. <clears throat> but in our experience, there are also companies who decide that actually they want to focus their resources elsewhere rather than on responding and engaging to shareholder proposals. And so there uh, often the goal will shift towards discouraging future proposals and also minimizing the disruption that these proposals present to the board and to management processes. And so having taken into account um, you know, a, a spectrum of, of the potential goals and, and identifying which ones are the priority, uh, we would suggest that uh, companies then formulate a shareholder proposal response plan. <clears throat> and so uh, as you look at this sample that we've presented here, at, at the left in the square, you'll see uh, what we just discussed, which is identifying goals for engagement and also researching the proposal. And so in, in your research, uh, you'll, you'll wanna consider factors such as um, how does the proposal align 
with current as well as future company policies. Uh, treatment of similar proposals at peer companies, <clears throat> investor and other stakeholder positions on this issue, the company's relationship with the proponents, and also the likelihood of future proposals. And so, you know, taking into account those factors, there, there are a number of ways um, that a company may proceed. And so if you look towards the top of the response plan, uh, one option is to prepare a conflicting management proposal under Rule 14A8I9 if, if the company does not agree with the shareholder proposal and wishes to potentially seek exclusion of that proposal on this basis. But as we will discuss later on in this presentation, um, the basis for exclusion under this rule has been drastically narrowed due to recent SEC guidance. <clears throat> The second option that we've presented here is uh, to attempt to engage in negotiation with the proponent. And so uh, as when we look at the goals for shareholder engagement, uh, this is an option that companies that, that are seeking to um, you know, become actively involved with the shareholder on, on a dialogue and, and to collaborate with the shareholder on a particular issue may wish to take. Um, in, in the happiest of circumstances, you know, there, there, is, there is a dialogue, the, the proposal is withdrawn, um, but in my experience, uh, this is often just the beginning of the process. Uh, there will frequently be an ongoing dialogue and frankly, future shareholder proposals. And so that's just something to, to keep in mind. And we've, we've also seen sometimes just how difficult it is to to engage in negotiations with a shareholder proponent because they're just not available. They, they're not available by phone. They don't return calls. They don't return emails. Um, they're not really interested in engaging. And their primary goal in many cases is simply to be able to voice their concern and get it in the company's proxy statement. Um, and at the end of the day, that's, that's their goal. And so they're really not that interested in engaging in a dialogue. So that can be a, a discussion that, that quickly leads to the next alternative. Yes, yeah, fair point, Gary. Uh, there are some shareholders who want to engage in a dialogue and then just the opposite, some that are really just looking for the opportunity to present the proposal at the annual meeting, which is the third option here. And so uh, then, you know, the company is really in, in the territory of deciding, okay, are, are we going to support this proposal? Are we going to oppose it? And then drafting thoughtful statements um, either in support or in opposition um, considering whether a proxy solicitor needs to be engaged to help uh, tell the company's story to a broader population of shareholders and ultimately taking a vote at the meeting. <clears throat> and, you know, many companies uh, feel th this is often uh, the root of, of least resistance and, and, and least time and, and resources spent uh, because you, you really just uh, put it up for a vote and if you're confident that uh, the proposal number one, you oppose it, number two, it's not going to get much support, uh, then th there's not a whole, a whole lot of effort that's being spent. And then, you know, finally, uh, for, shareholder, for companies that are faced with an issue where, where they want to make a statement that, hey, uh, you know, we don't think that this is an appropriate issue for a shareholder proposal, or we will, uh, you know, we, we will fight situations where, where we think that a shareholder is trying to uh, abuse the process. Uh, there is uh, an option to submit a no-action letter to the SEC, and uh, so there, really, the company needs to be prepared for an ongoing correspondence with the SEC and the shareholder because it's more and more the case. It's not simply just submitting the letter. There, there will be some back and forth um, that results from that. So this is really where it gets interesting for, for in-house counsel and their outside advisors. Um, when you receive a, a proposal to go in your proxy statement, it's usually not a welcomed uh, letter or uh, email, and in fact, it's something that usually um, gets flagged immediately for management so that they're aware of it. And um, I think the first two things you're going to want to do, quite frankly, are going to be to pull out uh, that sample timeline that we've provided to you and also the shareholder proposal response plan because people are going to be wanting to know when do we have to do what, and they're also going to want to know what are our options. And so it really gets to be uh, kind of fun talking about different tactics and strategy. 
Um, many cases, you'll be asked to think about what the grounds are for exclusion. You'll be asked to think about what we would say in a statement of opposition. What would that look like if that played out? So that and decision makers can really be informed about you know what the likely outcomes are and how this might look at the end of the day. For those of us that do a lot of transactional work, it's kind of fun too because you get to put on your litigator's hat and start talking about, okay, what are our best arguments? And at the end of the day, what are our best avenues for achieving the goals that Cam was just talking about? So if you're looking at excluding the shareholder proposal as one strategy, um, you'll want to be taking a look at those grounds for exclusion and Violet, maybe you could walk us through those. Okay, so what reasons are there to exclude a shareholder proposal? We've discussed how they can be excluded for eligibility and timeliness, um, but there are 13 substantive bases for excluding under Rule 14A8. There are other grounds for uh, excluding, on the next, excluding a proposal on the next slide, but I will not go through those. I'm going to go through the commonly cited grounds, which are violation of proxy rules. For example, the company demonstrates objectively that a factual statement is materially false or misleading, or the resolution is inherently vague or indefinite that neither the shareholder voting on the proposal nor the company implementing the proposal would be able to determine with a reasonable certainty exactly what actions and measures the proposal requires. Another commonly cited ground is the ordinary business operations exception, and that is the proposal deals with matters relating to the company's ordinary business operations. Another is substantial implementation. The company has already, which is the comp company has already substantially implemented the proposal. So here are the other grounds for excluding the proposals. At your leisure, please uh, read um, into the rules and what they say about each of these. Um, so, Gary, you know, there are quite a few options here in terms of basis for excluding proposals. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what are some of the more popular ones and, and what are some that just aren't quite as successful perhaps as they used to be? Yeah, so, so, first of all, I would say never underestimate the ability to have a proposal excluded because it fails to meet the eligibility or timeliness requirements. Um, these are technical requirements, but um, strangely enough, you, you can get back to people with deficiencies in terms of timeliness and when, and we've had that. Uh, the, the SEC takes a very open and shut view on that. Um, late is late, and it, it doesn't matter. Um, we've also been able to exclude proposals um, because the proponent sent in two, and we would politely remind the proponent that you can only submit one under the rules, and we would never hear again from the proponent. So we were able to exclude those. So um, take a look at timeliness and eligibility. If, if you don't have adequate support for stock ownership, make sure you go back and get that. Um, these are all things that you can um, be very successful on in excluding uh, a shareholder proposal if the proponent really hasn't dotted the I's and crossed the T's and they're not all that interested in um, following up with you to make sure it's corrected. Uh, violation of the proxy rules for materially false or misleading or vague or indefinite statements is one that typically comes to mind, Cam. Uh, usually the shareholder proposal uh, can have language in it in support of the proponent's argument that is uh, misleading. These aren't always very well drafted. It's sometimes hard to make, um, make out what the proponent is trying to say in their arguments. And they're sometimes filled with facts that are kind of cherry picked or don't present a fair view of the issue. So the immediate reaction um, by many companies is to say, well, this is, this is false and misleading. Um, and they're right. The, the problem here is that the SEC is really not very open to excluding proposals on this grounds. Um, in addition, should the, the staff actually determine that the statement was false or misleading, the proponent will have an opportunity to cure that by removing the statement or adding additional statements to provide additional disclosure. So. Typically, the, while you will see areas of the proposal that are false or misleading or vague and indefinite, uh, they're not usually gonna win at the end of the day. 
We do tend to include those, however, when, when the opportunity arises as an additional argument. We think that there's some value in including multiple arguments um, in the no action letter response. The, in the no action letter issued by the SEC, they will actually only typically cite one basis. But by adding additional arguments, I think you can provide more weight to your overall no action letter request. In addition to the extent that these statements made by the proponent are inflammatory or just out of the ballpark in terms of the reality check, I think it does, in my mind anyway, give you a strategic advantage going into the SEC staff, pointing out just how careless or erroneous the proponent was. The ordinary business operations rule has been fairly successful in a number of areas, and we'll talk about that later in terms of how uh, social and environmental policy types of arguments are successfully weeded out. But in many cases, we've been able to exclude based on the ordinary business exception. Substantial implementation has also been relatively effective, but at the end of the day, it's somewhat of a pyrrhic victory, Cam, because ultimately the company has already implemented the proposal. So the, the proponent has achieved what they set out to get in the first place. It does help kind of clean up uh, things if you have uh, if you have implemented a bylaw, for example, already. Uh, at least you don't have to put this in your proxy statement and raise it to the shareholders' attention. But at the end of the day, uh, the substance of the proposal has been put in place. We have found that um, the proposals that we've in the past were able to successfully exclude because they conflict with the company's proposal has been narrowly drawn now, and so that's virtually a dead letter. We've also found that um, shareholder proponents are getting smarter. They very, very rarely draft a proposal which is binding. Uh, they've all learned over the years that a binding proposal can be excluded because it's improper subject action for shareholders under state law, the 14-8-I-1 exclusion. And so consequently, shareholder proponents are very careful to word their proposals uh, to be precatory or non-binding. There will be other bases that could apply from time to time. And again, the very first step in your analysis as you look at the shareholder proposals to say which of these different exclusionary factors might apply and how can we make our best arguments for exclusion. Gary, thank you for that perspective. And so after a company has identified one or multiple bases for exclusion, there is still the process of, of submitting a no action request to the SEC and Violet, I was hoping you could speak to that. So to exclude a proposal, a company may submit a request for a no action letter to the staff of the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance. A no action letter from the staff provides its informal view regarding whether it would recommend enforcement action to the SEC if the company takes the course of action described in the no action letter request. A company must send to the SEC a no action letter request at least 80 days before the date it plans to mail its proxy statements to shareholders and simultaneously provide a copy to the proponent. The proponent may submit its own statement to the SEC and the SEC will then consider all the arguments and issue a decision typically within 30 to 60 days of receipt. Some helpful guidance the staff has provided are proponents stop sending us so many complaints. <laughs> Don't copy us in correspondence between the proponents and the companies, and companies and law firms stop calling us for response on letter status until, unless there is an imminent print deadline. It's a busy time of year at the SEC, and so they're basically saying, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Gary. If the SEC does not grant no action relief, the company must include the shareholder proposal in its proxy statement. A company must send a proponent a copy of its opposition statement no later than 30 days before its file, it files its definitive proxy statement. And if the SEC suggests that the proponent revise its proposal, that uh, changes from 30 to five days after the company receives its revised proposal. The proponent may, of course, challenge any false and misleading statements in the statement of opposition. 
The proxy statement must include the shareholder's name and address, as well as the number of the co company's share, shares held. The company may instead include a statement that will provide the information to the shareholders promptly upon request. If the proponent or qualified representative fails to appear and present the proposal without good cause, the company will be permitted to exclude all of the proponent's proposals for any meetings held in the following two calendar years. And if, in case anyone's wondering, that actually has been properly invoked. Uh, I, I've heard about a company where uh, they structured their annual meeting so that all of the proposals and, and the business end of the meeting happened at the beginning. Proponent, um, you know, was running late. I think she failed to catch a subway or, or a train that she was supposed to. Uh, shows up, tries to present the proposal, and, and she's precluded from doing so. So actually works. So now we're going to switch gears a bit, uh, and we're going to talk quickly through some 2016 proxy season highlights. So overall, uh, the total number of shareholder proposals submitted was slightly down from 2015. Um, proxy access proposals continue to dominate the landscape for a second consecutive year. In fact, as of August 31st, 39% of the S&P 500 companies provided some form of proxy access right. And although the average support for proxy access proposals declined slightly to 49% in 2016 compared to 55% in 2015, uh, these proposals continue to receive a majority of support at 27 of the 58 companies at which the matter was put to a vote. From a historical perspective, Cam, I mean, this is really unprecedented. I don't think we've ever seen um, such a successful initiative kind of across the board. Uh, organized and very effectively um, implemented by institutional shareholders to promote this idea of proxy access. Uh, the number of companies that did this either by virtue of receiving a shareholder proposal or did it voluntarily in anticipation or in response to receiving a shareholder proposal is, is really unprecedented. And I think um, it, it was definitely the year of proxy access, and it's not over yet. That's true. Definitely picked up momentum in the second year, and we don't really see signs of that stopping. In contrast, proponents were much less successful in garnering majority support on proposals of other topics, but it is notable uh, that nine environmental and social proposals did receive majority support in 2016, uh, including proposals on political spending disclosure, sustainability reporting, board diversity, and non-discrimination proposals. Now, as in prior years, many submitted proposals did not go to a vote because they were withdrawn following negotiations or they were excluded pursuant to a no action letter process. And in fact, the staff granted 68% of the no action requests that were submitted to it during the 2016 season. So Cam, given the success rates, what keeps driving shareholder proponents to lob in these proposals year after year? Except for proxy access and a few others like majority voting, they really have not been very successful in garnering significant support across the board. I, I think that's true, Gary, but uh, for a shareholder proponent, uh, often a, a successful vote is, is a very secondary consideration. Uh, their ultimate goal might be a lot less ambitious in that they're simply looking for visibility for their topic, uh, and also they're just looking to, to build momentum for, for the topic, and they see the company annual meeting as an ideal platform for that. And so to that point, uh, following proxy access, uh, some of the most common shareholder proposal topics in 2016 included uh, political and lobbying activities. And here in particular, I think we're seeing a focus on trade association spending and lobbying activity, uh, particularly uh, with regard to climate change policy. We're also seeing uh, executive compensation proposals uh, still being quite popular, and so proposals that uh, have to do with executive severance and change in control provisions. And then more generally, it, it's worth noting that a uh, particular compensation proposal surfaced past year um, asking uh, particularly tech companies in Silicon Valley to show a commitment to, to decreasing gender pay disparity. And there was a proposal at eBay that got 51.2% of the vote. And then some other popular topics include diversity reporting, climate change, and independent board chairs, which after proxy access 
behemoth that it was, the independent board chairs still continue to be the second most popularly submitted corporate governance shareholder proposal. Okay, we've seen a lot of these um, issues raised year in and year out, but I think, yeah. Cam, it seems like the one kind of newcomer in terms of making this uh, group of, of top proposals is in the diversity reporting area. I mean, prior to this year, we really hadn't seen that many um, proposals addressed to the, the whole concept of diversity and diversity reporting. Yeah, I think that's true, Gary, and, and we're seeing attention to diversity both at uh, the board level as well as within the employee ranks, and also an attention to what actually constitutes diversity. Um, and so we are seeing more attention to sexual orientation type of issues. So uh, moving on uh, for a recap on the 2016 proxy season, uh, many of you heard that the SEC staff issued its uh, legal bulletin 14H in October of 2015 that provided guidance on the scope and application of the ordinary business exclusion, as well as the scope and application of Rule 14A I-9, which is the basis for excluding a shareholder proposal that directly conflicts with one of the company's own proposals both of which are to be submitted to shareholders at the same meeting. And the SEC guidance in SLAB 14H uh, was in direct response to a decision that was brought down in Trinity Wall Street versus Walmart stores, uh, which many of you may have heard of earlier as well. And, and so just to recap, in this decision, the Third Circuit agreed with the staff's conclusion that a proposal subject matter related to Walmart's ordinary business operations, and so specifically the proposal had to do with the way Walmart decides which products to sell. Um, I think in this case it was guns. So in the decision, the Third Circuit articulated a new two-part test as to whether the significant policy exception applied. So does the policy transcend the day-to-day -day business matters of the company, uh, meaning that it must be divorced from how a company approaches the nitty-gritty of its core business? And then uh, beyond that, number two, does the proposal raise policy issues so significant that it would be appropriate for a shareholder vote? And so in the aftermath of this decision, the SEC, st SEC staff actually um, – repudiated this two-step approach and confirmed its own traditional one-step approach where a significant social policy exception by definition transcends ordinary business and, and is therefore not excludable. And so here, you know, it's interesting to see the interaction between the courts and the SEC staff. So while it's true that shareholders through private action can go to a court to overturn a no-action decision, um, ultimately the staff may decide how narrowly it will apply that decision and in fact the decision might not apply to future no action letter requests it seems historically cam that only a, a rare handful of proxy exclusion matters have ever reached a, the court level it's always been handled through the sec no action letter process and only rarely have we seen companies take something like this to court I agree. Uh, it does take an unusual situation for a company to decide that it wants to spend the time and effort to litigate this. And so uh, often we ask ourselves, what constitutes a significant policy issue? So the, at the staff discussion uh, at stakeholder meeting in June of 2016, I think the agreement was that uh, it really should be a matter of widespread public debate, number one. Uh, two, it, it should include legislative and executive attention and then also press attention. And so some examples of recent and popular significant policy issues, uh, of course, we can look to the environmental and social proposals that received majority support in 2016. So you're looking at political spending, sustainability, diversity, and non-discrimination. And as a very recent example of non-discrimination proposals, uh, we can look to the Procter & Gamble uh, no action letter in August of 2016, where um, the staff declined to provide relief for a proposal that requests a report detailing the known and potential risks and costs to the company caused by any enacted or proposed state policies supporting discrimination against LGBT people. Another potential uh, issue that we're seeing emerging 
is on reports on auditor rotation policy. And so this actually comes for, from our own experience in working on a no action letter um, that had to do with a, a proposal for a report on auditor rotation. And so in the no action letter that we prepared there, uh, we included a, a couple of bases for exclusion. One was uh, an eligibility basis, and two was the ordinary business basis, which had very firm uh, precedent in both uh, recent SEC no action letters as well as a chain of action no action letters from a few years ago. And so we were um, curious to see which basis the, the staff would rely on. Um, they ended up relying on the eligibility basis in order to grant our client relief when in fact um, similar letters in the past uh, they had cited ordinary business. Um, now it'll be interesting to see if this is part of a, a trend in the SEC's ongoing focus on audit related disclosure and audit related reporting. Um, but for sure we've seen the SEC encourage voluntary audit related disclosures and, and, and we do believe this is part of a trend. The other basis for exclusion that was addressed in slab 14H uh, was 14 AAI 9, which allows a company to exclude a proposal if the proposal directly conflicts with one of the company's own proposals to be submitted at the same meeting. And so historically, uh, the SEC uh, would have viewed conflicting proposals as presenting alternative and conflicting decisions for the shareholders and creating the potential for inconsistent and ambiguous results. In January of 2015, the staff revisited its interpretation of this basis and uh, subsequently adopted a newer, uh, much more narrow approach, which focuses on whether there is a direct conflict between the management and shareholder proposals and saying that a direct conflict would only exist if a reasonable shareholder could not logically vote in favor of both proposals. And so practically, what, what does this mean? You know, the SEC offered a couple of examples that really um, are, are probably of, of limited help to companies. So, for example, uh, there is a direct conflict if a company seeks shareholder approval of a merger and the shareholder proposal asks shareholders to vote against the merger. Um, number two, if a shareholder proposal asks for the separation of the company's chairman and CEO, and conversely, the management proposal seeks approval requiring the CEO to be chair. So a very limited application. Uh, I will note that there was a no action letter in March of 2016, the Illumina no action letter that demonstrates, uh, yeah, I mean, it's still possible in a very narrow sense to craft management proposals that intentionally directly conflicts with shareholder proposals. And in that case, um, the shareholder was asking for a greater than simple majority voting standard to be eliminated, and the management proposal sought approval of the existing supermajority voting standard, and the SEC staff did grant relief. Um, but to Gary's prior point, uh, you know, 14A8 I9 is, is, is quite dead these days. It, it, it's a very narrow basis. We used to be able to rely on that fairly significantly. Uh, for example, if a company was faced with a supermajority voting proposal, um, let's say they had an 80% threshold in their articles or bylaws, and the proponent was just asking for a majority, simple majority, we had successful in prior no action letters having the shareholder proposal excluded if management had a proposal to lower the supermajority requirement to say 75 percent or 66 and two-thirds percent um, simply by plugging in a different threshold um, in a different type of bylaw or article amendment it seemed like you could come up with a very sound basis and had a pretty good shot at excluding um, the shareholder proposal on this on this 8I9 prong, uh, but as, as Cam has pointed out under slab 14H, that's, those days are gone and it's going to have to be pretty much a binary um, approach. Either you could vote yes or no, but it's not a question of whether one has a higher threshold or lower threshold or some other um, more subtle distinction between the two proposals. It's gonna be a very black and white type of, uh, of a proposal before you can exclude it using I-9. And so the other basis for exclusion where we saw development in the last proxy season 
is under Rule 14.8 I-10, which is the substantial implementation basis for exclusion. And so, you know, obviously it permits a company to exclude a proposal if the company has substantially implemented it. And really the rule was designed to avoid the possibility that shareholders have to consider matters which have already been favorably acted upon by management. And we saw development on this basis in the context of proxy access. So earlier this year, the staff issued a series of no-action letters allowing companies to exclude proxy access proposals if they had adopted bylaws that fulfilled the essential objective of the shareholder proposal. So subsequently, and this is part of the general picking up of momentum on proxy access that we saw last year, at least 264 companies adopted proxy access bylaws with a majority adopting a 3-3-20-20 model where shareholders who continuously own 3% of shares outstanding for a three-year period may nominate up to 20% of the board and in some cases at least two directors. And under these bylaws, no more than 20 shareholders may aggregate their shares to reach the 3% ownership. After this flurry, certain investors continue to insist, no, proxy access is not over. The majority, the mainstream bylaws do not contain certain essential elements of proxy access. And so if you were to take a look at these proposals, their points are, you know, companies should allow shareholders to nominate up to 25% of the board versus 20%. There should be no shareholder aggregation limit. There should be no renomination limit for directors who are not very popular. And there should be no three-day deadline to recall loan shares. And so these shareholders subsequently submitted proposals to amend existing proxy access bylaws. The companies submitted requests for no action relief and the SEC staff has denied this relief in a series of instances, namely H&R Block, Microsoft, Cisco, WD-40. And so what are the implications for the rest of us from these no action responses? In their letters back to the companies, the staff was explicit that it was unable to conclude that a company has met its burden of establishing that it may exclude the proposal under Rule 14A I-10. And so there does appear to be a very lively debate that's ongoing about what constitutes the essential elements of proxy access. And this debate is particularly hypothetical because to my knowledge, no one in the U.S. has actually used proxy access to try to nominate a candidate. And so in this environment, it almost seems like the SEC is saying, okay, you investors, you are the ultimate arbiters. You know, we're going to have you vote on it and you decide whether these terms truly matter. And so companies that have already adopted proxy access bylaws, they're likely to receive proposals for additional amendments in the upcoming proxy season or future proxy seasons. A limited but informative data point, the H&R Block proposal went to a vote early in September and received approximately 30 percent of the votes cast. And so it did receive substantial support, but it did not pass. So, Cam, it seems like we've got good news and bad news from the SEC for companies on substantial implementation. The good news was earlier this year when they basically said, companies, if you're adopting a new shareholder proxy access bylaw, we're going to kind of give you the green light to do that as long as you're using a mainstream type of approach, the 3-3-20-20 model, and we're going to let you exclude a competing shareholder proposal on the substantial implementation ground. And that was a huge concession on the part of the SEC and made life a lot easier for a lot of companies and a lot of our clients. But then the bad news is that, you know, if you've already got one of these bylaws in place, and many companies do and are increasingly putting them in place, you're subject to attack then, Cam, for future shareholder proposals that kind of pick around the edges and are seeking to amend them. And if you've ever read one of these bylaw provisions, if you have one or if you've studied them, they have a lot of very detailed provisions about eligibility requirements and numerical thresholds, compensation, all types of issues. And 
Um, to me, this just seems like a very ripe area for future proxy proposals. And given the SEC's stance on this, um, if you're amending an existing plan, it's going to be difficult to have it excluded on the basis of substantial implementation. And at the end of the day, um, you'll be falling back on hoping that uh, it's not going to carry enough weight to, to be amended. Um, in advance of that, though, you might think about, well, if it does come in, if we do get a proposal uh, from a shareholder to tweak one of the provisions in our proxy access bylaws, you're back to the whole strategic uh, overview and the flow chart saying, is this something we're going to fight or do we just want to write the letter to the shareholder saying we're going to amend it accordingly? Uh, our board of directors is going to take the necessary action and you can withdraw your proposal. Yeah, that's right, Gary. And, uh, you know, so for those companies that are considering a proxy access bylaw or now they're taking a second look at what they already have, it, it is useful to keep in mind uh, the ISS policy currently on proxy access restrictions. And so there are certain provisions uh, that ISS would review um, and consider problematic, especially if they're used in combination with each other. And so we're talking about prohibitions on resubmitting failed proxy access nominees, restrictions on third-party compensation, um, restrictions on the use of proxy access and proxy contest procedures, i.e. advance notice bylaw procedures for the same meeting, um, how long and under what terms an elected access nominee will count towards the permitted number of access candidates, and when the access right will be fully implemented and accessible to qualifying shareholders. And uh, there are, in addition, two particular types of restrictions that ISS would review, would consider especially problematic, and they would view them as so restrictive as to effectively nullify the proxy access right. And uh, so it would be counting individual funds within a mutual fund family as separate shareholders for purposes of the shareholder aggregation limit and also imposing post-meeting shareholding requirements for nominating shareholders. So we really are kind of deep in the weeds on these proxy access bylaws, and um, not just because ISS has indicated that these are preferences doesn't uh, mean that we are advising clients to adopt or amend their proxy bylaws accordingly, but they are things to take into consideration, and it's, I think, helpful to pick your battles wisely. I would not recommend a, a proxy access bylaw that um, counts mutual funds uh, as one unit, and I would uh, also be very, um, you know, advising against providing for imposition of post meeting shareholder requirements. They just seem to be non-starters, and um, they don't really add very much to the company's overall protection. So that takes our narrative through the 2016 proxy season, and now we're looking ahead for trends and developments in the 2017 proxy season. So Gary, I'd like to ask you to start us on that. Fine. So as we've been saying, for those companies that have not yet adopted proxy access bylaws, we accept to see more proposals to adopt proxy access bylaws, particularly at mid and smaller cap companies as that trend trickles down. So if you are one of these companies that has not yet adopted proxy access, you may be wanting to give some thought to what your position is with regard to proxy access and having that discussion with management and possibly the board of directors in advance of receiving a proxy access proposal. Would you want to wait and implement a proxy access bylaw until you receive a a proposal from a shareholder? Would you want to move ahead on a voluntary basis because you're seeing that done in your peer companies or you feel like you're getting pressure from particular shareholders or from ISS? These are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about, but just know that the movement to adopt proxy access bylaws is not over and we accept, expect to see more of the same this year, particularly at the smaller cap companies. If you have adopted proxy access bylaws, you're not out of the woods yet. As we were just talking about, a big area for the coming season will be proposals to amend proxy access bylaw provisions. And CAM reviewed a number of those types of provisions that we think are ripe for attack. Based on the H&R Block and Microsoft letters, 
you will most likely not be able to exclude these proposals on the grounds that they've been substantially implemented. But at the end of the day, even if they are included in your proxy statement, they may not get a majority vote. We're also expecting in 2017 to see investors continued interest on board diversity, refreshment, and tenure. Last year, we saw somewhat surprisingly, board diversity proposals actually received a majority vote at two different companies. This type of issue in the past has really never garnered significant support, and we expect to see more diversity proposals and stronger support for those proposals. It's important to know what your, what your institutional investors have put in place in the way of standards for board diversity, refreshment, and tenure. For example, a couple of institutional investors have already uh, adopted thresholds. CalPERS and Legal in General probably have the most stringent standards for ex excessive tenure, 12 and 15 years respectively, and they take a ex comply or explain approach. So they're not necessarily going to vote against your directors if you provide an explanation. State Street Global, BlackRock, and others have also instituted different policies with regard to thresholds on director tenure. It's interesting, Cam, because institutional investors have been generally opposed to term limits and mandatory retirement ages, so they're not really in the business of making those kind of proposals. But as we've seen, as mandatory retirement age for directors has continued to increase and longer tenure among directors remains the norm, a number of investors are adopting more explicit voting policies to prompt board refreshment. And that's what we're seeing, and we may or may not see proxy proposals directly in the area of board tenure and refreshment, but we do expect to see continued pressure in that area coming from the institutions. And everything from the ISS recent policy survey indicates that this is a big issue and a continuing issue with investors. In 2017, we also expect to receive the types of proposals that have been common in the past. We're gonna see our typical raft of governance related topics, as I mentioned previously, majority voting, and also whether or not the chair and CEO position should be split. We're going to continue to see a lot of activity around political and lobbying, whether corporations need to provide reports and whether they need to disclose amounts and recipients of the funds. We're gonna see continued proposals in the executive compensation area, diversity, climate change, and other environmental issues. We still expect at the end of the day, however, that most of these proposals will not garner a majority vote. When you're looking at these kinds of proposals and you're thinking about your strategies and tactics, keep in mind that at the end of the day that they typically have relatively low success rates. And much of your discussion is gonna be not around the win-lose, it's gonna be around the appearance of the company of, of opposing such a proposal and how you're gonna phrase the statement in opposition so that you sound like a shareholder friendly company and a company that is friendly to the environment and supports ideas such as diversity and um, climate change control, control issues and yet uh, are willing to oppose a particular proposal because you don't think it's in the best interest of shareholders. That's where your artful drafting will come in. Also wanted to point out that we've seen Council of Institutional Investors um, start an initiative this year on majority voting. Earlier this year in August, they sent letters to over 180 companies urging them to adopt majority voting standards in uncontested election of directors if those companies still had a plurality vote standard. The CII letters went on to say that having a resignation policy is not sufficient. And many of you may have such a policy where if a director does not receive a majority of the votes cast, that director must submit a resignation to the board of directors. The compensation committee has the right to review and recommend it to the board, and the board at the end of the day has the right whether or not to accept it. And CII has said this really isn't what we're looking for. We want to see something hardwired into the articles or bylaws. So the big question here is, will CII use this as a springboard to launch a proxy proposal initiative. We'll be staying, keeping alert to that and keeping you posted. 
Another issue that we think may be uh, coming to a head in 2017 is this whole idea of graphics in the proxy statement. As we mentioned earlier, GE took a swing at this and they struck out with the SEC. So at this point in time, the SEC is very open to having shareholder proposals that include graphics in them. They haven't seen proposals, they say, that have excessive numbers or particularly large graphics in them. In addition, they haven't really ruled on any at graphics that seem to be misleading. So we'll see what kind of graphics are used going forward. We know that shareholder proponents view this as a real win, and we expect them to take advantage of this going forward. A couple of quick things to remember going into the 2017 proxy season is that um, ISS and Glass-Lewis have, have uh, last year announced their stricter overboarding limits. And these limits are going to take effect in the coming year. So they will be recommending a vote against directors who are an executive of a public company and who are on two or more public company boards, including their own. In addition, for an outside director who is not an executive, those directors cannot serve on more than five public company boards, including their own. So it's time to get out those limits, do a count, make sure that your directors are in compliance. The other quick thing just to mention is that this is the year that say on pay frequency comes to a vote. So yes, it's actually been six years since these provisions were first adopted. So it'll be time again to include in your proxy statement the question as to whether or not shareholders want to vote on say on pay on a one, two, or three year cycle. As we know, most companies are doing this annually now, and that's what investors want. So we don't expect there to be a significant movement in this regard. It's more just a, a reminder to make sure that this is on your checklist for the coming proxy season. And speaking of that, we are going to be having our annual Dorsey proxy season preview seminar in December, and we hope that you will join us for that. So with that, we've reached uh, the end of our time. Uh, for those of us who've taken advantage of submitting your questions to us online, we look forward to responding to those, and you'll be hearing from us shortly. If you have additional questions that have come up during the course of this presentation or in the future, please feel free to email any one of us. So I'd like to thank my co-panelists, Cam Wong and Violet Richardson. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Violet. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for attending today's webinar.